pleasure of working in the town hall museum since 2004. Um, basically, I was working at the front gates and it was 99 million thousand degrees outside and uh, just got done raining, the steam's coming off the pavement and they asked me to go work in the air conditioning back in the museum to cover a shift and been there ever since. Um, unofficially, I've had people call me the park historian. I have people call me the museum curator. Uh, I've been called worse because I also help out in guest services. Um, but I've been doing that ever since. In my other life, I'm a high school math teacher. So we're just finishing that up for the year. And obviously that's kind of crazy these days. And been a Sandusky resident since the early 80s. So I've been, been around for quite a while. So basically, this is all about a book that we did. Uh, it's called Rolling Through the Years. We thought that was a great title for a Sear Point book. And it's a Sear Point Atlas and Chronology. So when you guys are done with this and you're talking to your spouses, partners, friends, Facebook, the whole bit, and you mentioned Sear Point, they are going to immediately think roller coasters. This is what Sear Point's known for. Um, it is a relatively new thing, but it's with good reason. I mean, Sierra Point is the amazement park. It's a park like no other, but it's also the roller coaster capital of the world. And that started about 40 years ago with this ride. This is the corkscrew. And this was the first roller coaster to go upside down three times. There have been previous coasters to go upside down. Even a hundred years ago, they were going upside down. But this is the first one to go upside down three times and they put it in a great spot because you can walk and sit down and have lunch underneath the roller coaster and listen to people scream right over your head. And this was 1976. And I remember 1976 very well because this is the bicentennial, which is why the color scheme is red, white, and blue. A couple of years later, they just started setting records for height and speed. So this is the Gemini. Um, at the time, tallest and fastest. And the Gemini was named that because it's the twins in the Zodiac. And as uh, John will attest to, it was also kind of named for his twin sons, kind of unofficially, I think. Um, funny story on this one, uh, one of the first riders of this was the uh, CEO of the company, George Roos. He was 83 years old at the time. So there's no age limit with roller coasters. Um, but the governor, uh, Governor Rhodes, who was also supposed to go on the ride, actually kind of chickened out and went golfing instead. A decade later, uh, decided to set some records. This is the Magnum XL200, uh, advertised as tallest and fastest. So again, we're starting to, the coaster wars going on. First roller coaster in the world to hit the 200 foot mark. 72 miles an hour, so it's about the same speed as you would be driving on the turnpike. Now, this is an opening opening day picture, uh, that very popular. They use this for postcards, the whole bit. This is about four hours worth of people. And no fast lane, no fast pass, no exit passes, nothing like that. This is you basically go and you wait in line. Okay, so Magnum, uh, this is actually, like I was saying, one of my favorites. Uh, pictures that they actually took. Uh, this is opening day. They use this for advertising. Um, I'm not sure why Sear Point would want to advertise this many people at one roller coaster as a crowd. Um, but this is a four hour wait. And like I was saying, no exit passes and no fast lane. You basically went and stood in line. Um, but this was 200 feet tall, 72 miles an hour. So the next slide is the next record breaker. So Jeremy, go ahead and click. Yeah, this is Millennium Force. Um, even though this is 22 years old this year, this is still one of the most popular rides on the planet. Uh, 310 feet tall, first one to hit 300 feet, 92 miles an hour. And if you're going that fast on the turnpike, you're probably going to get a speeding ticket. Um, this is the most awarded roller coaster ever. It has won more awards. Across the, across the world than anything else. Uh, actually didn't hold the records for long, but that doesn't matter because it's still a fantastic ride. So a couple of years later on the next slide, 
we have the next record breaker. And this is top tilt drag strip. This is 420 feet straight up and 420 feet straight down. And this is 120 miles an hour. And if you're going that fast on the turnpike, let me know because I want to get out of your way. Um, now, after that, they started doing some other things, not necessarily record breakers. So the next slide, this is my famous, my favorite coaster in there. This is the gatekeeper at the front gate. Uh, very well photography. It's a beautiful ride. So this is, you know, it's pretty famous. But on the next slide, you can see not everything is famous. This is a 1964 roller coaster called the Broadway Trip. It was there for one year. Uh, it's hard to see. Um, it's in that red box on the right-hand slide. Um, this is an indoor wild cat, wild mouse. Actually, it's a two-seer. Um, was only there for one year, and then they moved it to another park. And this is where the Max Air and Giant Rockets um, locations are now. So over the years, uh, next slide, please. Sierra Point has had over three dozen roller coasters. So it's definitely the roller coaster capital of the world, but it always hasn't been that way. So next slide. And then the next slide. So this is uh, 1926. Uh, first of all, it didn't open until June. None of these May early openings. Uh, basically, it was just a June, July, August uh, situation. But if you look at the advertisement, it's not advertising rides. It wasn't the priority. Uh, the whole idea of the place was to kick back, get away from the rat race, kick onto the beach, have a good picnic with your uh, co-workers. Um, and that was it. I mean, it wasn't about the, the rides. Uh, George Beckling, the general manager back then, basically did it as a moneymaker. Wasn't the main attraction. Um, so next slide. It was all about the beach. And uh, Cedar Point actually has one of the best beaches in the Midwest. Um, one of the awards that Cedar Point has won in the past for their beach was run by Playboy Magazine, which I thought was really surprising that they would do categories like this. But this was one of the best beaches in the Midwest. Um, so, you know, next slide. So, obviously, quite the crowd. So, on the right, that's the bathhouse, uh, 3,000 changing rooms. And on the left, you see some of the water attractions, the trapeze and the, the water slide. But they, yeah, you can fit a lot of people on the beach. And they used it pretty much the whole time. Uh, next slide, please. Including at the night, this was a Sandusky day. So all the residents of Sandusky came over and had picnics and contests. This was a foot race going on. And it, you would basically be taking a steamship back across the peninsula from the marina area to back to Sandusky like at two in the morning. This was an all day thing. They had a king and a queen of, uh, for Sandusky day and they got $50 gold coins for that. But everything was centered around the beach. Okay, next slide please. So this is right outside the uh, pavilion area. Uh, you can see there's pony rides going on. Uh, I'm not sure in the year on this. The little building on the left is the band pavilion. Um, so that would be almost like a little dance floor where those guys are standing. Uh, but everything was centered about the beach. Um, everything else was a second thought. Okay, go ahead. And even to the 60s and 70s, still quite the crowd. Go ahead again. Um, so this is about 1970. I like this because they picked a model who was sunburnt. And uh, I, I thought that was pretty humorous that they would you know, pick something like that. But if you go look, look at the next slide, this was pretty, pretty interesting. This is a lady by the name of Frances Andrews. Uh, she is a... Um, I think great grandmother of somebody I worked with who uh, provided me with a lot of postcards, but she actually got arrested because her shoulders are bare. It was too risque. So she actually got in trouble for having her shoulders visible. A lot different than now. 
Next slide, please. So basically, when you went to Cedar Point 100 years ago, you dressed up. Um, I would be in a tie, working or just attending. Uh, ladies are all wearing dresses, and you basically went to socialize. And like I said, kick back, see your friends, and enjoy the beauty of the peninsula. Okay, next slide also. So you can see uh, this is the concourse, one of the games areas. Landscaping's perfect, and everybody's in their Sunday best. So obviously a lot of changes over the years. Okay, next slide. So I'm staying in Town Hall Museum. Uh, again, started there in 2004, and there's actually a lot of stuff written about Cedar Point already. So get asked all the time, why did I do this? Why did I spend the years researching this? What could I do that uh, hasn't already been done? And what I was finding out happening inside the museum was a lot of people were looking for answers to, to certain questions. I would have guests come in and say, okay, I want to know everything there is to know about the midway carousel or how tall a demon drop is or where hotel breakers got their you know, signage, all sorts of different questions. And as I was researching this, I would actually be taking notes because I don't want to look something up twice. And so I was collecting a lot of notes and uh, one of the guests, don't remember who, uh, actually also asked for looking at the old maps. And it started being pretty common. People wanted to look at the old maps to, to kind of look at the development of the place. And the uh, museum did have a few of them on display, but not a full collection. And so I started collecting the maps um, some were easier to find than others. And, and then uh, a few people suggested, hey, we'd like to have a collection of our own. So we started looking at the idea of putting this book together. Okay, next slide, please. So the first thing was uh, that I wanted to look at was the maps of the place. Now this is uh, 1750, so excuse me, 1718. This is one of the first maps of the Midwest. Uh, you can see it was done in French. Uh, the actual map is over in uh, Paris, um, and it's the entire Midwest. This is just a small portion of this, but this is Lake Erie. And if you notice, the bay is not called the bay. It's called Lake Sandusky with some different spelling. As far as we know, those three islands, uh, the two on the right are actually the Sear Point Peninsula, and they probably had a high water, so it was had water in between. And then the left one would be probably Johnson's Island. Um, okay, next slide, please. So, whoop, too far. There we go. Okay, so this is 1837. Uh, this is the first map that we know that said Sear Point on it. Uh, about 20 years after the city of Sandusky started, so that's just starting. Uh, we've got the marsh on the very right-hand side where um, the Raz and, and uh, Castaway Bay Hotel is. Um, very preliminary. Okay, next one, please. This is 1926. So this is when Sear Point's in its golden age. Uh, Left-hand side is Hotel Breakers. The pink part is the Bon Air, the extension. Uh, going to your right, then we have the pavilion, the um, square building or rectangular building right up against the lake, that is the bathhouse. Below that is the Coliseum, which is still there. And then on the right, that little semi-circle area, that's the amusement circle, which is where all the rides and the attractions and everything to take your money was. So you would land at the marina at the bomb, get off the boat, and go to the beach. That was your destination. Okay, next slide, please. So this is 1964. Uh, Park was not really still publishing maps per se. This is more of a blueprint type thing. Uh, but you can see the midway is going left to right instead of up and down because you're coming in by car, parking in that gray area on the right, and then probably heading toward the rides areas and the hotel and all that. Um, so this is the same general layout. I think this is one of the main transformations of Sierra Point was changing it from going marina to beach and then changing that to going uh, left, right. 
Uh, they actually took two years to do that. Okay, next slide, please. And then this is a little bit more modern. This is a, one of the first poster size maps. Um, I love this one. This is 1969. So Frontier Town is uh, going strong, but the only way to get there was by these uh, sky cars or the train. Um, but the main midway's pretty much laid out the same way it is. And uh, this is one of my favorite time periods of the park. I was at nine years old at this point in time, so was there as a kid. All right, next slide. So research, how did I get all this information? How would we put everything together, the logistics? Uh, what was easier, you know, being the author or being the publisher? And hands down, it was much easier to write this than it was to actually publish this. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So the first thing we did was kind of organize the information that was out there. Uh, so every ride, every building, every ferry boat, every person, personality, every event, every year, we uh, did a hard copy file and a computer file. So if I got information about, say, George Beckling, uh, the steamship, and something happened in a certain year, I would actually log in both places. Um, Images-wise, we started with a, just a main image folder. Um, lots of guests, lots of friends uh, lend me their collections. Uh, one gentleman gave me four uh, free ring binders just full of postcards about Sierra Point and just huge amount of information. Uh, Sierra Point opened up the archives to me so we could go through there and pull images. So we had the original image folder and then the Photoshop folder because you have to get things cleaned up, you know, correct damages, that kind of stuff. And then everything had to be formatted for the printers. So the original image folder we end up with about 40,000 images in there. Um, didn't obviously use them all. That would be a huge amount of space. Um, cleaned up the ones we didn't want to keep and formatted. And the book has got over 1,200 images in it. And most of them in color, which is great. Um, but every year, going back 150 years, we have a folder for us. So this took up a couple of file cabinets full of information. And obviously organizing what was already out there so we didn't have to, you know, do too much research was the first part. And we actually started this in 2013. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so research-wise, uh, we're really lucky in this area. We have a lot of uh, available resources. Uh, Sandusky, the library archives are huge. Uh, and I really wanna thank everybody that works at the library for helping me do all this. Uh, the Follett House, uh, we did a lot of research over there. Maritime Museum, the Merry-Go-Round Museum, all that. Uh, went down to the Ohio Historical Society for Donna Columbus for a few days. The Hayes Museum in Fremont was a big help. Uh, the Charles Froman archives, they were there, which is about 3,000 entries. And I spent a few weeks over there just digging through those archives. Um, Main problem is you're looking at 50 year old handwriting. And even though I teach, I still had problems deciphering a lot of stuff. Uh, the Aviation Museum, Sear Point was huge with uh, aviation in the area. So we spent some time over there. Uh, National Museum of the Great Lakes in Toledo, spent a lot of time over there. And Bowling Green State University has a collection, mostly maritime, a lot of pop culture stuff. So we spent some time over there. Okay, next slide, please. We also use the internet. Thank God for that, because I could do this at two o'clock in the morning. Um, Newsparkarchive.com. Um, if you type in and do a search for Sear Point and narrow it down to Ohio, you'll end up with 290, 392,000 entries. If you do the same thing for the other website, you get 158,000 entries, and there is some, a lot of overlap, but not much. So, I went through pretty much every single one of these. My daughter helped out with the company, so she also went through some of this, but I would be spending about four hours every evening after school going through entries, and you get really good at skimming. The problem is, is especially like in the 1950s, 1960s, you could be looking at an article about Sear Point that would bring up on this uh, search, and it would be actually for a garage sale coming up on the Chasse. 
because that was called Cedar Point Drive also for a while. The other problem is there's more than one Cedar Point in Ohio. If you go on Route 2 uh, past Davis Bessie and you're heading toward Toledo on your right hand side, that wild left rip refuge area is also called Cedar Point. So an archive search would bring that up also, but you can't tell until you actually open up the entry. There is also a Cedar Point in Maryland and there were civil war battles going on there. So the newspapers here logged in information about that. Uh, there's a Cedar Point in Texas, uh, one in North Carolina, there's a Cedar Point in New Zealand. Um, so I went through all of these entries. The other problem that we ran into is if the newspaper article said something about hotel breakers, like a checkers tournament going on there, or uh, John Philip Sousa was visiting, if that article did not mention Cedar Point and just said Hotel Breakers, our first search wouldn't find it. So we also did a search for Hotel Breakers. We also did a search for George Beckling. We also did searches for everything. The only thing we did not do is the Blue Streak separately because that's also the name of the high school football team and that would be overwhelming on that. Okay. Next slide, please. Websites, uh, there are lots of industry websites. There are a lot of fan websites. We pretty much uh, contacted all of those people and made sure we had all the information possible. Uh, we went through different, a lot of different books, the bibliography in the back of the books listing 68 different books. Um, I stopped counting at 375 articles, 18 different magazines. We just dug in and dug in and did lots and lots of information. The other problem we ran into is some of this information is conflicting. Case in point is the mill race. Um, the mill race actually had two opening days. The very first year, uh, it opened up in August, only was only open for three weeks, very popular. But the following year, Sierra Point decided that their marketing department said, hey, that was just a test last year. This is actually a new ride for this year. So you got conflicting information about when did it actually open. And some things we never did find out. Uh, the very first roller coaster at Sierra Point was uh, in 1892, it was called the Switchback Railway. I still have no idea how long it was actually on the peninsula. Uh, we know it was gone by 1906. Um, the only picture in existence is from 1894, but they don't advertise when things are getting removed, just when things are going in. So I'm not sure exactly how long it was there. Okay, next slide, please. So all the research is getting underway and we're starting to put the book together. Uh, we actually started doing the layout in 2016. So one of the first things is, is how are we going to do all this? Um, the maps were the main thing. We had to make sure we accommodated 75 maps and we didn't want to reduce them too far. So we didn't want to go small book with like fold outs or anything like that. So we end up having to go with a large book. So one of the first things is sequence. Are we going to do carousels first or are we going to do trains first? Uh, does dining come before live entertainment? Because um, the first half of the book is based on what it is. It's all by the topic. So everything you ever want to know about a carousel is going to be all together in one spot. So that's the first half of the book. The second half is the chronology. So even some minor changes made big differences. 11 by 17 is the stock paper size. So it's 12 by 18. Well, 400 pages um, times 11 by 17, that's 74,000 square inches. You go up to 12 by 18, you get another 12,000 square inches out of that and you do some math. And I mean, just that one change gives you 80 square feet of more working space for like just a, a small increase in, in, in cost. Have to worry about the graphics, which fonts are we going to use, the color scheme. Uh, we did a limited edition and a regular edition. And so the cover artwork, we actually had to do multiple versions and uh, everybody's got a favorite. Some people like the regular edition better. Some people like the limited edition better. Um, and then we worry about page layout. How is this whole thing going to flow and look together? Um, so go ahead, next, next page. 
So this is the main layout for the book. So we actually had two different types of things going on. So on the left, that's the chronology. So all the header, all the banners, all the coloring, the layout is got to be consistent. So this is 1981, uh, which is season 112. And the logo for that year was, this is the amazement park. Uh, closing day, opening day. A lot of people on Facebook argue about the weather. Um, pretty much, I've, I've, I've had people tell me that it was snowing that when opening day was for a certain year. And it's like, eh, that, that probably didn't happen. And that was easier research because Marblehead Lighthouse is the National Weather Service's station. They had all the records. I just went over there for a couple hours and copied everything over. Um, but opening day, closing day, new rides, rides last year, special events, ticket prices, show schedules. We wanted to put that all together year by year. On the right is the entry for the Magnum. And so pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about the Magnum is there. Uh, some of the, the concept artwork, some blueprint stuff, some of the advertising stuff, and some, some notes and details about that. Okay, next page, please. Printer-wise, uh, we found out that 12 by 18 is a stock paper size, but it's not a stock printer size. And um, our first choice, uh, liked them because they're in the Midwest, uh, talk, sorry, talked to them in, uh, I think it was 2014. They could handle the work, went down there, uh, showed them the, uh, like a prototype, rough idea of the page count, uh, got a tour of the facility, comfortable with the work quality, liked the price tag was good, you know, basically said, you know, we could retail this under $100. That's, that was great because I was worried about that. But every time I talked to them from then on, they raised the price tag. And finally, uh, we finally got a price tag, set the retail price at $125. We were starting to take pre-orders for the limited edition, uh, sent them the final files, got everything ready to go, and they gave me a final quote. And it was twice of the original quote from a few years before. And I was going to make a little bit of money at $125, but I was going to lose money if the retail source carry this. So we backed off and went to choice two. There um, was only about 200 printers in the entire world that had the machinery to do this. And luckily we found one uh, also in the Midwest. This was actually our, our the company we went, we went with for the printing. This was done by Jocelyn's yearbooks down in Nashville, Tennessee. Not known for doing much besides yearbooks, but they had a printing press where they could handle this. And they said they could make the 2020 winter chill release date, which is what we were telling all of the people that have pre-ordered this. Well, things happen, mainly COVID. So their workforce goes down to almost nothing. Um, the backing for the hardcover part is a special special order. I mean, it's, it's heavy duty. This is a 10 pound book. So it's gotta be able to handle that. And that got back ordered from their supplier so they couldn't make the, the release date. And then right after that, in March, Nashville, Tennessee gets hit by a tornado and their factory gets a power outage for over a week. So they started shipping us the book at a pallet at a time as they were getting done. Um, we took care of all of the limited editions, um, supplied Sear Point with what was left. They sold out in about three weeks, went back to Jossens and they, basically said, we don't want to do this anymore. It is just too much work. And they actually turned on the work. So in the midst of all this, we had looked at going overseas. Uh, had another um, company recommend a printer overseas. The quality is top notch, the price tag is top notch. The only problem, the only reason why we didn't go with them in the first place is because they could, they knew to the minute how long it would take them to print it but then you're putting in a slow boat from China. It's got to go through customs. It could take two weeks altogether. It could take two months. There is no consistency. And so we were kind of had like, okay, we're still trying to do the winter chill. So we basically did not go overseas. But as soon as Jocelyn says, no, we can't do it, then we did go overseas. So the print run we just got in um, was done in Malaysia. 
And luckily it didn't take that long to ship. Was really happy about that. Uh, next. Okay, so the other question is what do you do with these things when they get here? Uh, we ordered 2,100 books. They're 12 by 18 by an inch and a half. So if you do some math, that's a lot of cubic inches of books. Uh, do some more math, that's 393 cubic feet. So you got nine pilots of books. And the problem is also you got 11 tons of paper. This is a huge book. Uh, these are pictures from the, the Malaysia uh, factory as they're ready to go into shrink wrap and binding and all that. Um, but you also can't stack them too high once they're bound and cased because the weight will actually damage the books below them. You can only go about three feet high. So I run a home business to do this. Uh, my living room is not big enough for all of this. I can store a few, nothing like this. So we are actually renting a warehouse to be able to put all this stuff in. And it's local, which is nice because I just had to deliver more books to uh, Cedar Point this morning because they ran out over the weekend. Okay, so that's a lot of the nuts and bolts about the book itself. Um, so the next question, next slide is, if you don't already have a copy, where you can get one? And the Sandusky Library is the perfect place. Um, they have them in stock. They have a one in their archives that they will not check out, that they have copies here to check out. Obviously, it's on Amazon. Uh, Cedar Point has it in their stores at the park. Uh, also online, uh, Sandusky Maritime Museum has them. They're also available on our website. Um, local business-wise, if you guys can do it, if you're local, I would say go down to the Maritime Museum, get them from them. Might as well. So, that's the nuts and bolts about producing a 400 page, 10 pound history book at the park. Uh, the reviews have been fantastic. Uh, you can read them on our website. Um, I'm very, very happy with the response. And um, if you have a book that you need signed, I, I'm more than happy to autograph anything. Um, and we're gonna start taking some of the questions. And since I don't know how to set that up on this end, I'm going to ask Jeremy to actually leave where he is and come back here so we can do all this. So it looks like he's starting to do that already. So and I recognize a lot of faces. <laughs> if you want, uh, Ken, I can do it from here. That that works. Okay. So yeah, just if you can just bring up the chats. Yeah, I'll have to because I, I don't think. Uh, the chat. All right. Uh, is this, one? this is all of them. Uh, I've, been say, I've been seeing them. Some of them, some of them come through. Yeah, I um, see a few of them. Uh, here's the first one: was, uh, Will you be making another uh, atlas for Cedar Point, or are you continuing the book? Well, that's that's a good question. I mean, there, like like I was saying, there are other books out there about Cedar Point. David Francis did a fantastic one called "The Queen of the American Wiring Places." Um, he did three editions, about seven or eight years in between each one. Um, I think that's a little bit long, but that's an author's perspective. As a publisher's perspective, it's a question if you do it too often, then you run into the situation where you're not going to get the sales on the second and third and fourth editions because there's not enough changes. So it becomes a question of how much, you know, how much time do you want to let go in between? Um, obviously, I'm still gathering information. I still find out new things all the time anyways, um, not just the newer stuff, but also older stuff. Uh, just found out that uh, Sidney Froman and George Beckling back in the 1920s were looking at doing some, some stuff um, uh, off the peninsula. Um, but, Again, the question is, author-wise, I would love to be able to keep this going. Publishing-wise, it's a business, and we have to make sure that we do not lose money on a second book. And the last thing I want to do is end up with a 1,000 of these in a warehouse someplace and not have them move. Um, so that is something we're looking at. Uh, we're still doing the research so we can do it, but we're not going to go and do that quite yet. Um, one of the chat questions I just saw was, am I going to do anything with Kings Island? There's actually a Kings Island book that just came on the market um, within the last month that uh, I managed to get a copy of that is actually very well done. 
Uh, it's a nice quick read. Um, it's not a textbook like this is. It's more like the story behind the scenes about why things happened the way they did. Um, but yeah, I'm not looking at doing anything for any of the other parks. Um, it's actually pretty strange. I, um, I'm a Cedar Point employee. I can actually go down to Kings Island and walk in the door with my ID. And I have not been there in 20 years. I really go, I go on vacation and the last thing I want to do is go to another amusement park. It is um, like asking the Burger King manager to go over to McDonald's and not be critical about it. Um, I'm just a little bit too close to the industry. Um, to uh, Colonial Williamsburg probably 10 years ago and she works for the park also. And we started looking at their ticket booth area and she pulled out her camera and started taking pictures of it to go back and show her boss at the front gate. You know, this vacation, you know. Um, so I really don't hit the other amusement parks. I have no desire to start doing research on any of the other amusement parks. Collection-wise, though, I do have a pretty decent collection about the rest of the industry. Um, I do a lot of shopping on eBay and I picked up a lot of things, um, postcards and artwork and other books and that kind of thing. So I have a pretty extensive library and collection at home. Yeah. Okay, Jeremy, do you have a, another question? Yeah, here's another one was, uh, how did you figure out the price for the book? Okay. Um, yeah, a little bit of sticker shock from some people. I mean, it's a hundred dollar book, uh, but it's all based on the printing cost, um, which is also why edition and the regular edition were the same price because that is the same cost. You have to basically use, um, you have to take account that you are going to be, uh, you have to be able to sell it to Sear Point. They have to make enough money on their retail, keep, you know, make it worth their while. Uh, so there's, there's a formula there. It's all based on the cost of the book. Um, not going to get into the math on that. Um, but it's pretty much the same story across the board. Also, um, the one thing also, if you take a look at it, if you look at price per pound of the book and compare it, um, you'll have a, like a novel come out or a biology textbook and doing same cost per pound no matter who you who you go through. I mean, it's just the whole way the whole industry is set up. But the first thing, like I said, it's all based on cost. Um, obviously, the time writing this does not play into that. Um, yeah, this was seven years worth of work, um, but this was just as much a labor of love as anything else. And, you know, kind of go from there, so. Okay, next question. What, what, what's the status of the museum now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Town Hall Museum, uh, basically, and this is the, even though I'm an employee, this is the unofficial word is uh, that I got at Winter Chill, is that the uh, project was put onto a back burner. Um, basically, it is a work in process. I do not know a time frame about when it's going to be ready. Um, I'm assuming that it, since they at Winter Chill said not this year, is still the case. So I am working at guest services in a, like a booth outside the town hall. So the locations I can still do all the guests. So right now it's a big empty room. Um, I have not been inside the building, so I'm not sure what the process is. Um, hopefully it'll be soon. Um, I know a lot of stuff is in storage. The uh, steel vengeance model that uh, Matt Smoser was doing is actually in their car building will stay there because Matt will not want to move it back into the museum because it's such a pain to take apart and put back together. Uh, the carousel horses are still on the peninsula, ready to go back. A lot of the new displays are ready to go. So um, it's just waiting for the word from corporate. So I, I have no idea of time frame. And if anyone else has any questions, they can um, either unmute themselves or put the Put the questions in the chat box. Yeah, just unmuting is fine. Whichever you feel most comfortable with. I just wanted to ask, um, as far 
you said that if anyone wanted to have the book signed, um, mm -hmm. are you going to have certain locations or? Okay, well, I, I do work at Sierra Point. Um, I'm at the guest services in the back of the park. Um, I, I really don't do much in Sandusky per se. Uh, obviously, don't want people stopping by my house and having me sign it there. The best thing to do is if you are coming to the park, bring it, put it in your car. Don't carry it a mile back to town hall <laughs> and put it on there because I'm there. I'm not there full time. Um, but put it in your car or send me a Facebook message or an email through my website, and we can kind of coordinate logistics. Uh, I do live in Sandusky. I have no problem. By me, so it's coffee shop or something like that. It's just you know figuring out the logistics of it. But if you're going to bring it to the park, leave it in your car first. Don't carry it through the park. Come back to the town hall. Make sure I'm there, and then we'll kind of figure out a time frame. But yeah, I don't plan signing anything except for you know divorce papers or something like that. So, yeah, because honestly, honestly, the reason that we purchased the book on Amazon was because we didn't know if we could carry it more than from the front step <laughs> into <laughs> we didn't want to be carrying it through the park at cedar point well um, <laughs> okay. i'm going to do a well, case on Thursdays. and uh yeah. we're using two pillars and all that stuff so, but yeah i have no problem signing it uh answering questions about it um uh, on sunday when i was there i had five people who purchased the, the book in the park and brought it back to me and had me sign it um, but like I said, just leave in your car and then we'll figure it out. Um, I usually work in the mornings and early afternoons, so we can, you know, meet at your car in the afternoon or something like that. Thank but yeah, you. send me an email through my website and we'll figure out the logistics. So now I'm hoping you're enjoying the book. Oh, def definitely. Yeah. We good on anything else? I just had a question, uh, Ken, uh, yeah. in your research, uh, obviously, uh, the GA Beckling Company uh, was in the real estate business uh, on right. and off in the in the 20s. All the different roads and everything were built along the Chausse, and then the Depression came along and that died. And then after World War II, of course, uh, they sold a lot more off. And I just wondered if if that's a subject you were you had researched at all. I, I did a lot of research on that. Um, part of the issues that you run into on some of this is, is the only source of information on that. Some of this is newspaper articles. Um, you know, a lot of the, the actual company records are nowhere to be found. Um, mm -hmm. And the other problem is also back in the day, 100 years ago, they had multiple to have to do with the peninsula. So, you would have one company that would handle the uh, transportation issues from the um, marina down to uh, the docks in Sandusky. You had another company that would handle the logistics of the buildings on the peninsula, one that would handle the real estate, and they're all interconnected. And so it was really hard to tell who's talking about who on these records. It'd be like something like the Sierra Point Company, but you're never sure exactly which division they're talking about. And George Beckling has hands in a lot of this stuff, um, being the general manager and CEO and all that. Uh, so the records are, and then, you know, just hard to find in the first place. And a lot of times there's conflict between the records. Uh, where you have one division of the Sierra Point Company back then saying one thing and the, the, another division saying something else. Um, and just so, yeah, there was a lot of research, but I try not to get into the actual logistics, the legality of what's going on with that um, and try to keep it basic. So I do have a lot of notes on it that just never ended up in the book because it's, it's well, you know, you live on this, I'll say it's complicated. It is. You know, yeah. I always... Uh, have you ever heard of Beckling's bathtub? Beckling's bathtub? No. Yeah. When I was a kid, we lived uh, where, well, at 1423, and there's that pond back there. It's behind Mike Prout and and Linda Reichenbach's house. Okay. And and in the in the 20s, there were uh, I remember them concrete. There's a there's a street that came down, and there was an oval in front of our house, dates back to the 20s and then walks back there and that had been dredged out and they were gonna build cottages around that. And that was Beckling's bathtub is what it was called. 
Okay. And then the, the Cedar Cove was Boiler Cove. And then of course you had B Miller's Cove and then there was Ken's Cove. And again, it's so confusing. You, you know, you, you can't find anything about where do these names come from and why is it right. Boiler's Cove? And, right. I, I, I know the, the research on the Chasse is difficult. Um, you know, one of the interesting things I found out was the, uh, the, the school bus situation because the far end um, down by um, basically toward Huron was part of the Huron School District. Right, right. And then Sandusky was the other end. So Sandusky right. had to drive through the Huron District to pick up the Sandusky kids. And then the Huron was shorter. So, that, I mean, that was a four-year fight over, the, you know, getting that squared away. So you had, you know, kids were riding the same bus that were next-door neighbors. Um, yeah. Just a lot, a lot of things going on. One of my favorite arguments was the building of the Sierra Point Road. Um, because when the Chasse was first finished, it stopped at First Street. And if you wanted to go on the Chasse, not the Chasse, the Causeway, my bad, the Causeway. And so if you're going on the Causeway the first year, you went through downtown Sandusky on the first street and then turned the corner and went there. And it did not connect to Cleveland Road yet. Uh. And there was a huge fight over that connection road of who's going to pay for it and who's going to maintain it. Cedar Point owned the property and they were going to build it, but the city of Sandusky was afraid because this is when the Russo LaGrosse thing was happening and they were really afraid that this was um, going to fall apart and Sandusky was going to get stuck with maintaining this road that they were not going to need. And, um, you know, Cedar Point was offering to build the road, donate the property to the city, but they were not willing to plow the road in the winter. Mm -hmm. And it took about three years for that to get done with. So, you know, it's a lot of these internal and external politics was just like, wow, just amazing imagine. stuff. Well, it was like George Beckling getting arrested during Prohibition for being a rum smuggler. <laughs> you know, he threatened to close down at Sierra Point if, if they arrested him. And they came over and threatened it too, and they confiscated the alcohol that was in his house legally and uh, raided... Uh, Pretty much every board of directors' house looking for alcohol this is you know during the prohibition, and uh, he, he said, "You put me in jail, I shut down the park." So they never <laughs> put him in jail. <laughs> he did. And he got it. I remember he went to the 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 federal court over in Toledo for that and beat that rap and got all the alcohol back too, if I remember. Yeah, right. yeah, because he had it legally. I mean, um, but you know, I mean, you know, Cedar Point it's what thirty miles away from mainland Canada. It's easy to rum smuggle around this area. So, whether or not he was involved or not, who knows? Uh, but they busted some uh, guests over at Hotel Breakers. They busted a whole bunch of bellhops for uh, during Prohibition for supplying, and it was all coming across the lake. So, but that's another book. <laughs> but yeah, there's. There's a lot of good stories about the park. Um, the, this book is a textbook. Okay, that's what it's designed to be as a, a resource. But I still found out a whole bunch of stuff. Um, one of my favorite stories in 1921, there is a hotel, uh, hotel breakers, front desk clerk by the name of Harry Welsh. Um, not sure about the, the pronunciation of the last name. It's a weird spelling. Uh, he's taking his lunch break, lunch break on the boardwalk. He's got a half hour, and he is kicking back and knows that there is a girl uh, pretty much having problems in the lake, in, the, in the, the tide area, and runs out and rescues her before the lifeguards get out there and uh, stays with her. EMT shows up, uh, which at that time was coming from the administration building, and then everybody's fine. He goes back to the boardwalk to his bench and starts finishing his lunch. Well, obviously, this took longer than his lunch break. So the hotel manager is coming out looking for him because he's late and starts basically ripping him a new one. And he is like, I'm taking my lunch. I deserve this. And the manager is about ready to fire him over this. And George Beckling comes over. 
And George Beckling, had, whose office was in the administration buildings, found out what happened with this girl that they had rescued from the lake and was actually coming over to congratulate this employee <laughs> for rescuing her. And the um, manager was about ready to fire him. So that also smoothed over. Beckling um, offers to buy the guy a good steak dinner that evening um, and then actually ups it to every evening for the week. And he says, well, I'm not the one you should be congratulating. I didn't do anything. You need to take care of the girl who you just pulled out of the lake that is scared to death. Give her the steak there. So Beckling, excuse me on this, uh, Beckling basically bought them both steak dinners. They started dating. And in September, they got married. Yeah. I thought that was just one of the great, great stories about guest services at Cedar Point. <laughs> So, how are we doing? Any other questions about anything? All right. Well, if there are okay. no more questions, I want to thank you all for joining us and thank Ken for agreeing to do this for us. Um, like I said, if you have any friends who are interested in the program and couldn't join us today, um, I will have it up on YouTube. Hopefully tomorrow, barring any more technical issues and considering how today went, it probably won't be that easy, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're going we're gonna to hope that it will be up on YouTube tomorrow on our YouTube channel for people to watch. Um, our brown bag topic for next month will be on the 1924 tornado. Uh, that is kind of a, I would say preview, but um, I will also be doing that as a walking tour towards the end of June as well. Um, have my dates uh the 20 june 26 which is a saturday and june 28th which is a monday um mm -hmm. and we'll be doing a, a walking tour downtown um and we'll kind of follow the path of the tornado and and uh we'll we'll have lots of photos to show the damage done to the town and talk about what happened uh so once again thank you all for joining us for a brown bag uh hope you all enjoy the rest of your week and ken i'll be up in a minute to give you your uh memory card back Sounds good. Thank you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody.